<clears throat> well, right at the very beginning, I said, no uniforms. I don't want to be in a uniform. It pains me to speak these words, but Patrick Stewart was so wrong about Star Trek Picard. Like, somehow all of his instincts about how to bring Jean-Luc back were just off. But it was only those missteps and the lessons learned from them that has allowed the show to finally succeed now in its last season. Sheer f***ing hubris. Listen, I love Stuart. Like, love him. Back in the day, I used to follow him around to his different theater performances. I saw his one-man version of A Christmas Carol several times. Oh, here. One time I dragged my wife, then girlfriend, down to Washington, D.C. to see him do Othello on New Year's Eve. Another time, I was trapped on a cruise ship with him for five days as we crossed the Atlantic Ocean. Or was he actually trapped with me? Once again, love has proved to be life's sweetest reward. All of which is to say that I have worshipped this guy for literally decades, but he got it pretty, pretty wrong when he decided to bring back Picard, which, ironically enough, has turned out to be a good thing for the show in its final season. Let's talk about why that is. And no, I'm not going to say... Engage. It all boils down to one thing. If you're going to do the nostalgia play, you got to commit. At that point, I had to fully commit. And Patrick Stewart did not commit. At least, not for the first two seasons. No! No! After saying goodbye to the character in Star Trek Nemesis in 2002, the actor would spend the next 15 years having to answer questions about whether or not Picard would be back one day. It's possible. I think it's unlikely, but it's possible. I benefited from it so much, but uh, sometimes there is a downside to identification with one character and one show. I have publicly so many times said, I'm done. Cut to late 2017, early 2018, Star Trek Discovery had relaunched the franchise on the small screen, and executive producer and new Star Trek overlord Alex Kurtzman was trying to convince Stewart to come back as Jean-Luc for a new show. I admit, I was uncomfortable at the beginning when it was proposed, and indeed did actually pass on the idea which meant there wouldn't be a series. Of course, the actor would eventually agree to a return, but only under certain conditions. And it was those conditions that would lead to big problems for the show. Two of Stewart's original demands may not seem like much at first glance, but they would have a snowball effect on the trajectory of what would become Star Trek Picard. No uniform and no Starship Enterprise. That basically means no Starfleet, right? No Starfleet. So, taking that to its natural conclusion, it also pretty much means no next generation, and no cast from the next generation. Indeed, Michael Chabon, the Pulitzer Prize winning novelist who was a writer and EP on season one of the show, said in 2020 that the plan when designing the series was that it was not ever going to be the next generation part two. Which, sorry Michael, but Picard season three is now 100% the next generation part two. Fire everything we've got! Stewart's longtime number one Jonathan Frakes, who plays Riker, remembers when the actor broke the news to his old castmates that he was heading back into space without them. Patrick was very, very clear that the Picard that he wanted to make was post Next Generation. He could yeah. not be more clear publicly and privately. It was never part of uh, the original plan to have any of us. And, and he, you know, to his credit, he had dinner where he invited everyone and said, I'm doing a new show. And frankly, it's just Picard. And I want you to hear this from me. Sure, Franks and Marina Sirtis showed up for an episode in season one, and Brent Spiner popped in here or there too, but there was a clear concerted effort to avoid the cast, the family if you will, that made the next generation so beloved over the years. In their place, Jean-Luc was given a new motley gang of distinctly non-Starfleet types who, let's just say it, were mostly poor replacements for the crew of the Enterprise. From Santiago Cabrera's cigar-chomping freighter captain, to the tiring roboticist played by Alison Pill, <laughs> to Evan Avogora's elf-like Romulan pretty boy, most of these characters never really wound up hitting in any meaningful way. I am beginning to regret that I ever allowed myself to be talked into doing this. And besides, cosmic leather jackets are simply no substitute for a nicely tailored Starfleet uniform. None of Picard season 1's leads wear Starfleet duds, unless it's in flashback, but the secondary and background characters who do kinda look like they have Halloween costumes on. It's a really weird miss on the costume department's part. Oh! 
It's not just that Starfleet uniforms should look cool when done right, they also mean something to these characters and the actors themselves. To have her play my daughter in Star Trek, to have her wear engineering gold, it's pretty cool and very emotional for my family. See, that's the thing. Maybe Stuart or Shaban don't really get this with their acting awards and Pulitzers and eating fancy cheeses on their yachts while drinking champagne, champ champagne cocktail. But stuff like the uniforms and the starships and the props, it's all super important to Star Trek. Terry Metalis, who took over as sole showrunner for season three, gets that in spades. It's world building, and it makes the universe that Picard lives in feel real, especially after almost 60 years of the franchise being on the air and in theaters and wherever else. As important as Patrick Stewart as Picard is to Star Trek, having Patrick Stewart as Picard occupy the world of Star Trek is equally, if not more important, and that's one of the ways the first couple of seasons of this show went wrong. The people behind Picard's sister show, Strange New Worlds, get this. Consider the first season finale where a Captain Pike from an alternate future shows up wearing a version of the movie uniform that Captain Kirk wore in Star Trek 2 through 7. It scratches a fanboy itch, sure, but it also just makes sense in the larger canon. Though we know our Pike is fated to be gravely injured in an accident eventually, if that accident never happened, as with this alternate Pike, then he would have presumably wound up living a version of the life Kirk led well into the movie era, which is where the so-called monster maroon uniforms like this flourished. Had trouble sleeping last night. My hiatal hernia is acting up. The ship is drafty and damp. I complain, but nobody listens. The uniforms of Starfleet are also indicators for the type of characters being portrayed. If you're wearing Starfleet red, gold, or blue, you've basically outgrown the petty, selfish concerns of, say, the primitive humanity of the 21st century. You stand for something more than yourself. Principles like duty, honor, sacrifice, and truth. Oh yes, truth. If you can't find it within yourself, to stand up and tell the truth about what happened. You don't deserve to wear that uniform. When the first two seasons of Picard elected to tell the story of mostly non-Starfleet characters, it was jarring in that suddenly we were confronted with players who seemed much more contemporary and who sometimes seemingly broke long-established Star Trek rules. Take Michelle Hurd's Rafi Musiker, who wound up being the best thing to come out of those first two seasons, but she had to find her way back to Starfleet first in order for that to happen. On a similar note, look at the main ship from Picard season one. I mean, I get wanting to try something different, but it really doesn't work. It just doesn't elicit any of those Trek feels. Remember how carefully the evolution of the various Starship Enterprises has been imagined over the years? And then look at this refugee from Star Wars Disney Plus show. Again, Stewart's no Enterprise mandate led to a spiral of non-Star Trek design, story, and character choices. Okay. Sure, we got Starfleet vessels here or there in the first two seasons of Picard, but the fleet that finally shows up in the season one finale had to have been a budget-saving move considering the disappointing copy and paste nature of it. And in season two, we got a really nice version of the Stargazer, as well as some other ship cameos, which felt huge at the time after the scarcity of Starship porn from the previous year. But then the show dumped its characters into an alternate past and away from those ships for pretty much the whole season. Here's the thing about Starfleet ship design though. Their very nature is often key to the plot and themes of Star Trek itself. Because they're bigger ships that are typically crewed by hundreds of people, they require a ton of discipline and coordination, from the captain giving orders on the bridge all the way down to the transporter chief standing around in that room all day waiting for that order. It's great fun. Well, James T. Kirk said it best. You have to learn why things work on a starship. Each ship has its own combination code. Yeah, man, we're even talking prefix codes here. You're like 10 minutes into this video. What did you expect at this point? Sir, our shields are dropping. Raise them. See, there's an inherent drama built into the operation of a starship, and we've seen it at play time and again in Picard season three. From Sidney LaForge piloting the Titan, to Riker having to step in as acting captain, to malfunctions, repairs, and all the rest of it. The whole Starfleet notion of working together for the greater good is literally manifested in the crew working together to run a starship. And besides, I don't know that I'm giving her all she got, Captain, really works on a ship with a crew of five. <sighs> Damn it! Putting aside those questions surrounding the refit of Riker's USS Titan, Season 3 just automatically earns goodwill for taking place on a starship for a change. And actually, let's not put aside those refit questions, because that's also the point. Fans debating how the Titan would become this version after a refit and what the difference is between a refit and a completely new ship? It's just what fans do. We used to get our asses kicked in grade school because of debates like that. Thank you. 
And Picard Season 3 gets that too. Is Season 3's visit to the Starship Museum, which features all of our favorite ships, pure fan service? Yeah, of course it is. But it's more than that too. The USS Voyager. I was reborn there. She was my home. Her crew were my family. Even Commander Rhodes' ship this season has a unique but classically Starfleet design that reminds us that not all of the ships of the fleet are the same, but the excitement of a new design can be thrilling, just as Nicholas Meyer taught us all the way back in The Wrath of Khan. Slow to one half impulse power. And speaking of Roe... Roe Laren. When Michelle Forbes' character Ro Laren returned to the Trek fold for Season 3 Episode 5's Imposters, Picard further proved that it could reconnect to the old, but do so in a new and satisfying way. It's not that the show hadn't tried to incorporate past elements into the storyline before, but they had done so with an almost embarrassed approach in Season 1, and then a frankly scattershot and laughable one in Season 2. Tell me about it. Take the show's return of the Borg, who appeared in the first season via The Artifact, a disabled Borg cube that had become a research facility, or something? It's actually pretty confusing when you watch the episodes, and The Artifact ultimately doesn't add up to much of anything at all in terms of the emotional impact it has on our characters. Picard and Jerry Ryan 7 of 9, both ex-Borg, are barely affected in any meaningful way during their experiences with The Artifact, despite the life-altering assimilation they had suffered at the hands of the cyborg race. Meanwhile, another ex-Borg, Jonathan Del Arco's Hugh, also resurfaces here. He'd appeared in a couple of memorable Next Generation episodes, including one where Picard actually contemplates using the young Borg as a tool to commit genocide. If you are going to use this person to destroy his race, you should at least look him in the eye once before you do it. But again, there's little emotional payoff in his return or his death or how any of it affects Picard. Really, the Borg is a concept that has been overused on Star Trek at this point, so the fact that they were incorporated into seasons 1 and 2 of Picard, and now season 3 as well, perhaps speaks to a level of creative laziness. Still, they're fan favorites, etc, etc, so I get it. In season 2, we didn't just get the Borg, but the actual Borg Queen as well. And not just that, but another confusing story that wound up turning the Alice and Pill character into the Queen by the end. Which, really, as long as it meant getting her off the show, it works for me. That was the idea, mister. Look, this isn't to say that what has come before Season 3 was all bad. Season 1 had some interesting ideas and moments, but every time it hit a bump, you could just feel Stewart's mandate lurking, like, well, like the Borg mono voice speaking inside everybody's head. No uniform and no enterprise. So when Forbes shows up in Season 3, we actually get not just closure on a 30-year-old plotline, but it's all wrapped up in such a way as to set up the rest of the season too, as she reveals the bigger conspiracy that the show has been building to. Look. Old school spycraft. We last saw Roe in 1994's Preemptive Strike. It was the penultimate episode of The Next Generation, and at the time, it seemed to wrap up Roe's storyline for good. The character had been recurring since season five, set up as a sort of foil to Picard and the rest of the crew because of her unorthodox and troubled background as a survivor of the brutal occupation of her homeworld by the Cardassians. While she came to be a loyal and respected member of the Enterprise crew, in preemptive strike she defected to the resistance group known as the Maquis, who were devoted to continuing the fight against the Cardassians. Could you tell Captain Picard something for me? Of course, what is it? Tell him I'm sorry. So long, Ro. Take care of yourself. And that was the last time we saw her. Goodbye, Will. It was a rare instance where the comfy, cozy, human ways of the Federation hadn't completely assimilated yet another alien character. Yeah, we're looking at you, Spock and Worf. Later, on Deep Space Nine and Voyager, it was established that the McKee had been almost completely wiped out by the Cardassians in the Dominion. Additionally, Michelle Forbes had passed on the chance to star as Ro on DS9, so the chances of her character ever returning have seemed unlikely for quite some time now. And yet here we are, with Forbes not just back, but the episode also digging in on all that past baggage regarding her character. Picard has felt betrayed by Ro for all these years, even as Ro feels like Picard never fully understood her. Tabaldor ut kahar saye ut sigram faran. Your Bajoran has improved. Oh, I have been rehearsing this conversation for 30 years. 
You have no idea what it was like living under your relentless judgment. This wasn't about judgment. We had a bond based on mutual respect. It's all wrapped up in the season's bigger theme of legacy. She's practically the daughter he never had, which is appropriate for a show that is finally fully embracing the concept of the next generation, and it also gives Stuart and Forbes some really great, meaty acting moments. I wish just once that you could look into my heart and understand that I only did what I thought was best. All these years, I wish you'd known me, and that I'd known you. When you compare the return of Roe to, say, Hugh, you also see how the Picard Season 3 writers can examine what came before while using that to deepen and strengthen not just the characters that we have loved for all these years, but also the story that they are telling in the here and now. And they're not embarrassed by it. They're not afraid to explain how Roe got from point A in her debut appearance to point B in her final next-gen episode, and now to point C here. Meanwhile, poor Hugh went from this to this. And we never learned how. And it didn't really matter anyway, because we ultimately didn't care. <laughs> Season 3 is also managing to make us care about the new characters on the show too, like Todd Stashwick's Captain Shaw. He serves a basic plot purpose, sure, which is to represent the rigor of Starfleet's rules, the boring part of life in the service where you do what you're asked to do and you don't color outside the lines, which of course is what our heroes like Picard and Riker have often done in the past, and which Shaw doesn't hesitate to remind them of either. He vocalizes things that other people like would wish they could. Uh, he's, he has this sort of blue collar grace about him. Uh, he's blunt. He's wonderfully passive aggressive. Oh God, uh, he's, he's sarcastic and he's always right. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. He is! <laughs> if you actually look, he makes the right decisions when he has all the information. Mm. This sets him in conflict with Picard and our favorites, and it's a trope that Star Trek has used since its earliest days. Do you know how many times Captain Kirk had to put some Federation delegate or Starfleet admiral in their place? I am fully aware that the admission of Corridan is a highly debatable issue, but you won't solve it here. But again, here the writers are pushing the boundaries of Trek and what we expect from it by actually shading in Shaw's character. Why is he such an asshole? What gives him the right to talk that way to Picard? By the time we got to episode 4 and learned that he was a survivor of the Borg massacre at Wolf 359. Did your old man ever tell you about the time that he and I first met? A massacre led by a brainwashed Picard, Shaw suddenly clicked into place as more than just a plot device designed to get in our hero's way. A long time since we all sat around the table like this. Too long, really. Ultimately, what Picard was missing all this time was the crew that helped make the character the icon that he is. Riker, Data, Crusher, Worf, Geordi, Troy. Because as great as Jean-Luc is, these guys are also amazing. And they're his family. And by episode 8 of season 3, they were all finally reunited around a conference room table once again. All that matters is that we are together once more. Because I need you. All of you. Not having the old Enterprise crew around was like a galactic case of blue balls for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> One that was even more acutely felt when Riker and Troy did show up for the perhaps only really good episode of the first two seasons, Nepenthe. We realized there that the next generation characters could grow and thrive in ways that the old show and movies never let them do. Now, in 2023, modern television allows them to do things that didn't really fly back then. Take the conflict between Picard and Riker, for instance. Credit to Terry Metalis and Patrick as well. He took us to lunch and said, I imagine the conflict between these two characters who have previously had been supportive of each other and friends and all the things that Riker and Picard were. And uh, it intrigued both of us, obviously, and it gave us much more interesting things to play as, as actors. That the strife between the two comes in part as a result of Riker's own fears after the death of his son, well, that just deepens the character's story even more and gives Jonathan Frakes room to play Riker like never before. Indeed, Picard himself, and by extension Stewart, enters new ground here as well when Jean-Luc learns that he and Beverly Crusher have a grown son he never knew about. And not just that, but this is no happy reunion. His son Jack doesn't want anything to do with him at first. 
both of those characters are, are internalizing feelings about their sons, which kind of leads to the conflict later on the bridge. Jean-Luc, talk to him. Moments with your kids. You never know what you might regret. God knows. So hopefully that is emotion that you can tap for some good drama, but it's also thematic about the last generation and the next generation and how we all come together or not. And look, it's not like Picard season three gets it right all the time. How often does that happen on any show? It definitely lapses too far into Easter eggy fan service at times, and some of the dramatic beats just don't work. But it understands what world it's playing in, and it unlocks the key to porting over the crew of the Enterprise D into our modern storytelling format. Wolf is one oh, huge example. Fabulous. Of the transformation mm. in the nature, character, and behavior of this man is extraordinary. And so brave to do that. Because, you know, one of the reasons people watch series is that they're familiar. They're familiar. You partly always know what you're going to see, but not with this one. Mm -hmm. Nope, not with this one. Worf the warrior has become Worf the Zen master, basically. I am Worf, son of Moog, house of Martok, son of Sergei, house of Roshenko, bane to the Duras family, slayer of Gowron. I have made some chamomile tea. Do you take sugar? Which may seem shocking at first, but is actually the perfect trajectory for the character. Michael Dorn's Klingon has always been searching, always trying to find himself and the balance between his Klingon heritage and his human upbringing. Here, be a Klingon. Thanks, man. So of course that journey would have continued since we last saw him in 2002. It's not like these characters stopped living their lives, waiting for us to continue along on their paths. But despite all this change and upheaval for these characters, the season has also managed to connect back to the Star Trek of it all too, which was another thing the first two seasons of Picard were sorely lacking. Take the birth of those space creatures in episode four. And what better way to come out of that catharsis than good old fashioned Star Trek sense of wonder. If you came out of that, uh, of a family kind of becoming aware of each other and coming together to this family being born in this nebula, that maybe you might have, you might have a, a kind of a quintessential Star Trek Roddenberry moment. Patrick Stewart may have been wrong three years ago when Picard launched, but he seems to have come around since then. I think he's all in. I mean, he's really digging this season. I acknowledge that they had a vision, and it wasn't initially my vision, but it gradually became so more and more and more, as we were encouraged not only to explore the lives of our characters in the past 20, 25 years, but our own lives too. Hey, the guy can admit he was wrong, and that's the least you'd expect from a captain of the Enterprise. Jean-Luc, wherever you go, we go. For even more on Star Trek Picard, check out my chat with Freaks, Burton, Dorn, and Metalis. And as always, be sure to like and subscribe to IGN for all of your Star Trek needs.